Hi, in this presentation, we will cover energy efficiency as an aspect of cost and opportunity. More specifically, we will look on why heating, cooling, and lighting are form givers in architecture. And we shall start our presentation with the premise that all buildings experience interruptions of conventional energy availability, often coincident with weather extremes and disasters. And as the photo suggests, with unabated greenhouse gas emissions we pump into the atmosphere, we certainly are nearing doomsday for Mother Earth. And this is all because of our ever-reliance with conventional energy, especially fossil fuels, which uh, exacerbate global warming, resulting to unprecedented climatic anomalies. In the uh, building sector, from material production to construction, and most especially during the actual operation of the building, great amount of energy is consumed. The building sector has the uh, greatest share of the total energy consumption in the U.S., accounting to a staggering 48%, and only 27% is consumed by transportation and 25% by industries. Of the 48%, only 8% is consumed during construction, while the bulk of 40% is attributed to the building operation. This means that to reduce the energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions generated by the use and uh, maintenance of buildings over their uh, lifespan, it is necessary to properly design, site, and shape buildings with natural heating, cooling, and daylighting strategies to achieve energy efficiency and improve the overall building energy performance. And to understand the importance of energy efficiency, we take the case of Le Corbusier where he learned this the hard way at the Salvation Army building. This is his first urban housing project and was originally designed to have a double skin glass facade with fans blowing in between the glazing. Unfortunately, due to budgetary constraints, the building was constructed in 1933 with only one fixed glass curtain wall, consequently leading to problems of overheating during the summer. With its uh, excessive thermal gain due to its inoperable south-facing curtain wall, occupants wanted to have window openings in the facade so to provide them ventilation during the summer. Until in 1944, the glass facade was destroyed due to bombings by the Nazis. And after the war, Le Corbusier was again commissioned to redesign the facade of the building. And from his troubles in Latin America, he found finally the solution, which is a bright solel of horizontal and vertical sun shading device made of concrete. And so we can now marvel at the Salvation Army building, fully restored to its former glory back in 1952. And of course, modernized to suit our modern culture. Uh, this was done by the team of Francois Chatillon as the prime architect. Learning from his experience with overheating in the Salvation Army building, Le Corbusier after the war now incorporates the Brysolel as main feature in the design of his buildings as we can see in the facade of Unit d'Habitation where he devised the Brysolel in accordance to his Le Modular Proportioning System. He even incorporated a parasol roof as one of the shading device to his buildings as could be seen in the High Court of Justice in Chandigarh, India as well as in the Palace of Assembly and also to his Notre Dame de Hau Chapel in Ronchamp and finally to his uh, Center Le Corbusier in Zurich. From what was shown and as experienced by Le Corbusier 
it is utterly important that we consider energy efficiency in the life cycle of buildings which uh, leads us of course to the topic of bioclimatic design. This concept developed out of a sensitivity to ecological and regional contexts and the need to conserve energy and environmental resources. And we can find timeless lessons of climate responsive design in indigenous and vernacular architecture throughout the world. Even in our Baha'i Kubo, we could deduce a lot of lessons of climate responsive designs such as for example its thatch roof which is a very good thermal insulator its high heat proof that allows convective cooling inside the house the elevated bamboo floor with slits allowing free air circulation and inducing further convection similar with its slotted bamboo walls allowing cross ventilation also the wide owning windows that provide good cross ventilation while protecting the interior from direct sunlight and rain and not to mention the roof overhangs and of course the open plan allowing proper uh, cross ventilation of the whole interior of the house it also showcases a balcony for alfresco socialization. Thus, the Baha'i Kubo is an excellent example for maximizing ventilation as well as for thermal insulation. We can see that bioclimatic approaches to architecture attempt to create comfort conditions in buildings by understanding the microclimate and the resulting design strategies that include natural ventilation, daylighting, passive heating, and cooling. As with this example, from the Palafito home to a house as a system for the generation of renewable energy, water collection, and urban agriculture with its rooftop living gardens to reduce the impact of urban heat island effect and to recycle building materials. Another case study for bioclimatic approaches is the Echlin Street Terrace Apartments that achieved good climate responsive design, resource efficiency, as well as affordability. The result is a 16 contemporary 2 and 3 bedroom terrace apartments that are naturally cool and better to live in socially, economically, and environmentally. In terms of affordability and resource efficiency, they have achieved this through the retention of the concrete floor and sections of the walls and roof from the pre-existing warehouse. The result is a reduced quantity of demolition waste, avoided use and purchase of new construction materials, and a decrease in the labor required in construction. Further, typical unit is only occupying around 84 square meter of the land area. In terms of climate responsive design, they adopted the key principles for good climate responsive design in the tropics which include keeping the heat out, for example, proper orientation, providing shade, a reflection of radiant heat, proper insulation, and the appropriate use of thermal mass. They also have maximized cooling breezes and cross ventilation. In order to keep the heat out in terms of orientation and shade, majority of windows are facing north or south. This results in easily shading the windows by just the use of eaves and overhangs. Low angle sun from the east and west will only impact the end wall of each unit block. Further, east or west facing windows are kept small 
tinted and high up under the eaves to minimize heat gain. Gray tinted glass was used throughout mainly for privacy but it is also effective in reducing glare and ultraviolet radiation. Additionally, in terms of shading, polycarbonate sheeting, shade sails, partition walls, the uh, vent well, and the main deck itself were used uh, to shade outdoor spaces, thus demonstrating the importance of shading outdoor spaces. In terms of breezes and ventilation, the prevailing breezes are funneled into the complex along an east-west aligned breeze corridor, thus allowing an uninterrupted circulation of air across the complex. Another example is the Sun Shower SSIP House, a Sustainable design for a 1,000 square foot, two bedroom, two bathroom house that provides its own energy and water needs. It utilizes steel structural insulated panels that snap together and are extremely strong, with standing winds of up to 225 miles per hour and an earthquake of up to an 8.6 magnitude. The house is situated in the Caribbean and the caribbean climate is mild and much of the year no cooling or heating is required if natural ventilation is available thus they utilized ssip to create large uh, sliding panels that operate like barn doors to open the primary living space to the outside in addition window and door openings are located to encourage uh, cross ventilation and a series of freeform apertures are proposed in these panels for light and breezes. Further on the roof, one part is optimized for solar panels, while the other funnels water into the courtyard for bathing, washing clothes, uh, flushing waste, and watering a small vegetable garden as could be seen in this sectional view showing the concept of water recycling integrated into the system and as a last example for bioclimatic approaches we take a look at a conceptual house design in inner mongolia the villa 003 uh, the house and the rural landscape are unified through the main roof structure of this concept. It showcases a uh, furrowed surface that resembles a plowed field planted with crops and local flora. In the concept, an open space passes through the building rather than around it. Thus, the building and site become one. In addition, the tilting southward of the site maximizes exposure to the sun. Moreover, a uh, series of spaces are carved out of this platform structure to create courtyards that provide light and air into the interior of the house and further function as exterior extensions to its programs. On the roof structure, we can see the implementation of planters, areas containing soil, skylights that allows uh, sunlight, pergolas and an outdoor shading device that allows uh, air circulation. And indeed, we can see that the Bilia 003 is a well-cultivated house. In line with bioclimatic design, we move on to daylighting. Architecture has always been shaped by considerations for sunlight and daylight. From Greek porticos as protection from sun and rain, to their Parthenon glorifying the goddess Athena, to the Oculus providing lighting and ventilation for the Pantheon in Rome, with the abundance of daylight with mystical quality of large stained glass windows 
in Gothic cathedrals and even to showcase the opulence of late Renaissance culture in the form of Baroque architecture. We can also see masters of architecture in the 20th century incorporating daylight into their architecture as can be seen in the skylight after the lily pad capitals of Frank Lloyd Wright's dendriform columns of the Johnson Wax headquarters. We can also see the clear story windows in between the wall and the ceiling bringing light into the interior. And again, a massive skylight abundantly bringing natural light from the roof of his Guggenheim Museum in New York with clear story windows on the circular wrap gallery of the museum. Even the Corbusier knows the importance of natural light as showcased with the deep splayed windows for his Notre Dame de Haut Chapel that provides an ephemeral lighting for the pilgrims. You would also notice how he intentionally made the roof or ceiling somewhat floating through a narrow opening in between the walls and the ceiling. And indeed, from the words of Le Corbusier, architecture is the masterly, correct, and magnificent play of masses brought together in light. And therefore, shape guides daylight. Perhaps the most significant design determinant in the use of daylight is the geometry of the building. Its walls, ceilings, floors, windows, and how they relate to each other affect the level of daylight. And for our case study, let us take a look at the only building designed by Le Corbusier in North America, the Carpenter Center for the Visual Art at Harvard University in Cambridge. Often, the footprint or floor plan of the building can be sculptured to achieve shading from the direct sun and or to control the view from the interior. To understand the implementation of daylight for the Carpenter Center in terms of building geometry, let's start uh, looking at the building configuration. On the model, we could see the building mass as a clustered volume of articulated cubic form on top of lung-shaped podiums bisected with a rump along the east and west orientation. This provides varying opportunities for daylight and views for the center. Furthermore, the deep bright sulel with light shelf and angled walls and windows on the building facade prevent direct sun penetration while still allowing daylight reflection and view. Next, we look at the aperture where floor to ceiling clear glass windows are installed on deep uh, beton brute brisolel which allows ample daylight to enter the studio rooms illuminating a depth of two and one half times the height of the window additionally some windows in the lower floor have undulating concrete mullions which provides interesting play of light with uh, rhythmic framed views after aperture we look at the room depth where majority of the rooms in the center are relatively narrow. This, together with the height of the windows, provides adequate level of daylight inside the studio rooms. As can be seen in the second floor of the center, where uniform lighting could be seen. Also at the third floor, even without the use of artificial lighting, adequate level of daylight is achieved. However, the fourth floor has a deep studio room with angled windows and bright soleil. Following the rule of thumb that an adequate level of daylight could only penetrate a room depth of 
2 in 1 half times the height of the window, we can see as indicated by the blue arrow lines the extent of uh, good natural lighting entering the room. This is around 10 meters depth, assuming the window height is 4 meters. Thus, almost half of the room as indicated with the dark shading does not receive proper amount of daylight. This was made worse with its angled window and brisolene. Although a light shelf is provided, it is still not enough. Thus, the best solution for uh, deep rooms is a skylight above the dark area indicated by the red dotted rectangle. Currently, they have also installed partitions that greatly increased the glare and contrast within the room, resulting to uneven lighting. Thus, they are using artificial lighting to provide uniform lighting inside the studio room. Next on the building geometry that affects daylight is surface reflectance. The Carpenter Center has extensive use of the tone brut on its facade, including the brisolene. You can also see matte white uh, paints on the ceiling and interior walls, and also a light semi gloss concrete flooring. With the use of the tone brute finish, the bright sulel, including the light shelf, has a poor light reflectance and this will make worse the problem at the fourth floor of the center. However, glare is reduced on the surface of the bright sulel because of the beton brute finish. In contrast, we can see good light reflectance on the white ceiling aided with the light shelf, even though it is finished in raw concrete. And lastly, on the building geometry, we have overhangs. The Carpenter Center, as with the other brutalist buildings of Le Corbusier after the 1930s, has deep rise level. Generally, overhangs can reduce daylight, especially on walls near the windows, as we can see on the darken interior sides of the brisolel in the photo. However, with deep horizontal and vertical shading, glare on the glass surface due to direct sunlight was minimized. Furthermore, the overhangs are effective on reflecting light from exterior planes, thus providing an even distribution of interior lighting, especially if it is painted White. However, in the Carpenter Center, the Beton Brut minimizes the reflectance of daylight. As for the Carpenter Center, indeed the shape or building geometry truly guides daylight. Now to summarize, we take an excerpt from the book of Norbert Lechner. According to him, when architects draw the first line at the schematic design stage to design a building, they simultaneously start the design of the heating, cooling, and lighting. Because of this inseparable relationship between architectural features and the heating, cooling, and lighting of buildings, we can say that the environmental controls are form givers in architecture. And before we conclude, we look back at our initial premise at the beginning of the slides that all buildings experience interruptions of conventional energy availability, often coincident with weather extremes and disasters. We could then end with the precept that a prudent approach to design of all buildings would provide bioclimatic means to ensure at least subsistence levels of heating, cooling, and daylighting for comfort, health, and safety. And hopefully, we could see this realized in the Edit Tower for the Ecological Design in the Tropics in Singapore by Hamza and Yang Architects. And of course, to your future designs. And thank you, future form givers.